Thank you for coming out and welcome. And it is a real pleasure to um, introduce Aidan and Mary and to welcome them to UMass Boston. Aidan read here a few years ago um, at the time of his the publication of his first book of poems. Uh, but this, I believe, is Mary's first official visit as, as a reader, and it's great to have her here. In introducing these two Irish poets this evening, I could take the easy route and trot out any number of well-worn touch, touchstones from the poems of William Butler Yeats, Ireland's first Nobel laureate, and even relative to our much celebrated contemporary Seamus Heaney, uh, probably still the Irish poet with highest name recognition among both readers and non-readers of poetry. Yeats left behind a catalog of extractable one-liners that any poet might envy and that any introducer of Irish poets might play, connect the dots with to produce a shimmering string of poetic pearls. So some of Yeats', Yeats finely tuned lines, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. That is no country for old men, it's very much in the wind these days. How can we know the dancer from the dance? Irish poets, learn your trade, sing whatever is well made. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. Perhaps one or more of these finely tuned phrases would serve as an apt table setter for this evening's reading by Aidan Rooney and Mary O'Donnell. But just as likely, they would lead me into the temptation of a famous line of Heaney's, whatever you say, say nothing. So, I do want to use just one line from Yeats. And I want to use it to say something about these two fine poets, and in particular about their hot off the press second books of poems. Aidan's Tightrope and Mary's Among These Winters. The line is not one of Yeats's best known lines, but it is one that does speak directly to the work of our two poets here tonight. It is from the very first poem, The Song of the Happy Shepherd, in Yeats's first book of poems, Crossways. And it reads simply, Words alone are certain good. As you will hear this evening, and will, I trust, come to appreciate, each of these poets has a serious investment in words, the common currency in which poets trade. You may hear words in Irish or in French from Aidan Rooney, or if you read either of his salad-centered poems, you may find yourself salivating over exotic ingredients that surely must taste as good as they sound. At the very least, you will find yourself drawn into his poems and kept there by the precision of his diction the sense that every word counts, and when rhyming is involved, the sense that every syllable of every word counts. Words alone are certain good, indeed. In Mary O'Donoghue's case, there will be some exotic words as well, some of them simply part of the Hiberno-English vernacular. Skeeter, blagging, yobs, letouts, blatherskites. But there will also be familiar words used in exotic ways. Having allowed Yeats into the room, I might as well allow James Joyce in, too, who explained to a friend his use of the word almosting in the Proteus episode of Ulysses. <laughs> Joyce said, that's all in the Protean nature of the thing. Everything changes. Parts of speech change, too. Adverb becomes verb. So in Mary O'Donoghue's poems, we find words like chirpy and guinnessy in the same line, no less. We find avalanche used as a verb, and clinic and murky transformed into verbs as well. And then there's that wonderful nounish abstraction, muckle-mouthedness. <laughs> but before I get too carried away and steal the poet's verbal thunder, let me rein myself in by adding a little gloss to Yeats's assertion that words alone are certain good. Out of context, this notion, the belief in words for words' own sake, the validity of the poet's medium as both message and massage, to borrow doubly from Marshall McLuhan, may suggest that poetry is little more than wordplay. But as Yeats himself acknowledges in The Sad Shepherd, the compliment to the Song of the Happy Shepherd, words alone may not be enough, even for the poet. For the happy shepherd, whose bliss derives from extreme subjectivity, words invested with a sufficiency unto themselves amount to mere melodious guile, to a self-delighting but also a self-deceiving dream. For the sad shepherd, words must be put to work. They must carry the burden of sorrow. Of course, words are not pack animals, and as the sad shepherd discovers, any attempt to place unreasonable cargo upon them, to make them bear the burden, and to merely bear the burden, eventually produces only an inarticulate moan. So 
So what we find in lyric poetry, in the sort of word-rich poetry practiced by Mario Donahue and Aidan Rooney, is what Yeats well knew, even so early in his career, that the purchase power of words for the poet, that is, their grip on something besides themselves, is actually determined by the dialectic represented by his two shepherds. While words or verses without thematic weight attached to them serve primarily an ornamental function, that same thematic weight must not be so great as to overwhelm altogether the transcendent potential of the poetic utterance. What we will hear this evening, then, is a pair of poets for whom the word is not an end in itself, but the means to open up the poetic self to others. Thinking of Thoreau's reminder that it takes two to speak the truth, one to speak and another to hear, and thus invite you all to open up yourself to these poets in turn, we may share their belief in how words alone are certain good and more. And now I want to introduce, I mean, individually, I'll introduce Aiden first and then introduce Mary when her time comes. Um, as Aiden uh, commented, this becomes an instance of age before beauty, um, and so we will uh, start with that. Um, and that's, that's the coin toss. So I'm very happy to give you Aiden Rooney, who is a native of County Monaghan. Aiden has been in these parts for about 20 years, uh, teaching French and English at their academy just down the road in Braintree. His first book of poems, Day Release, was published in 2000. And I was very pleased to give it a favorable review at the time, and as I mentioned, very pleased to host Aiden here at UMass Boston at the time. His fine new book, Tightrope, was officially launched in Dublin just a week ago, on Holy Thursday, no less. So please welcome Aiden Rooney to UMass Boston. Thank you, Tom, for that glowing introduction. Thank you, Joyce, for having us here. It's a great pleasure to read at UMass, and a great honor to read again with Mary. Um, I was in Ireland last week, as Tom said, and I discovered that green is the new cool in Ireland, as in America, and in the developed world in general. So I'm going to open with a very large green salad, uh, a list, really, of every conceivable leaf you might want to eat. And I don't know about you, I'm hungry. This might make you hungrier. Apologies in advance. It's called Salad Garni. Drizzle the wall of a vast bowl with virgin oils, olive and nut, one acquiescent truffle drip, a touch of lemon zest, then pitch in loose sheaves of baby greens, butterhead lettuce, arugula, cress, spinach, and sorrel purslane shoots to cool the liver, and not much, bergamot, cilantro, basil, a little lovage for its salt oomph, delicate anise of mere dandelion, sweet marjoram. Toss and garnish with the blue tops of wild hyssop, umbels of cream archangelica, to soften skin, flaxen petaled calendula, nasturtium spurs, whose pepper nectar the hummingbird hums to, primrose, forage, rosemary, sage, and vitamin-rich viola odorata, mustard, and pansies, elderflower to neutralize, yarrow to sedate, the heart's great burn that wants to make you such a salad. Nabokov, I think it was, who called um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a very whiny book. <laughs> a few people remarked that this is a very foodie book. It's a bit of wine in it, too. And both of these are served in more than a few poems as a kind of flourish of tentitude more often than not, sometimes as a gesture um, or a curative. So let me turn to a poem in which it is thus. This poem is called The Visit. Um, if that was the mother of all salads, this is the mother. Uh, it's the first in a sequence of poems that elegizes my mother, Claire, who died eight years ago. And here I, I recollect a dream I had some months after. And as, as is often the case in such dreams, of course, she's alive and well. Um, but for some very odd reason, she is living here in America, not in Ireland, where she's supposed to live. 
and even odder still, she's not living with me. She has somehow managed to move in with my neighbors, my next door neighbors in Bingham where I live. In fact, for a while afterwards, I was nearly tempted to report them to Homeland Security for harboring my dead mother as an illegal alien. And I think I'd add too that my mother was a very devout Catholic, ardent frowner on consumerism in general and a, a wonderful baker of bread, daily loaf of wheat and bread. The visit. Last night you were living with the neighbors. They showed up with their boys, as they always do, on the porch some weekend evening, bearing a salad, a bottle of red, a six-pack for themselves. And you fell right in after them, no introductions, wearing one of your flowered summer skirts and carrying the big cream ceramic bow you started breading. Everyone smiled, kissed hello, and acted normal, except for you. A certain coolness in your manner, as if to show some hurt that you hadn't been invited. The seared tuna came out perfect on the new grill. The kids behaved. I expected you to scold us for the fuss. No call for half of it. The new kitchen you escaped to while we sat down to food. There's a pretty little girl from Oma in the county of Tyrone. I overheard you sing. And when you left with them, you left with me. A wheaten loaf with the deep cross you liked to score on top. Your white fingers disappearing to tell beads in your apron pocket, your lips going through the little motions of well-meant recurring prayers, the core of the bread underneath burning my palm. Let me move on to some lighter fare. Um, this poem is called Chansonnet, which means little song. And here the speaker in the poem is encamped in the abandoned medieval perched village of Auper de le Vieux in Provence, in South France. Chansonnette. In Opidum, I live, a bum, hair and clothes in tatters. My home, a tomb, you might assume I'm weary of chit chatters. But I'm post all that, new age old hat that addles idlers, squatters, with opium to help me strum, this song, the mistral, scatters. I ask, what song? The tedium, mulling lofty matters. Spring is almost with us, so let me turn to two birds aloft in a tree, pigeons, as it so happens, doing that spring thing of courting each other. Actually, yeah, actually, the male courts the female, but the female gets to choose. So this is my contribution to all that cycle babble of the pursuer and the pursued and intimate relations. I was a bit of a bird watcher as a kid. Now in midlife, I find myself redrawn to birds, in this case, pigeons. Um, those of you who know your pigeons will know that the male, once his amorous business is done, will lift his wings in a kind of a jumping jack flash routine and um, as a kind of self applause for his good business done. Spring court. Two pigeons making out high on a bough of a tree I'm sorry to say is dead. The girl one has chosen. The way he fanned and dragged his tail, courtesy, sent shivers down an especially iridescent neck, strutted and drove after her in circles, has brought her here to teach him how to kiss. He gets it right, how she likes it, and not what might have made the self delighting his. Her bill thrust inside his, she nips the tongue, exciting him to jump her bones, straddle her up-pointed ass, a short while it takes. Rising then, the cock shakes out of his wings, claps twice, alights, and makes to kiss again. Another spring poem, a chronicle of flowers. 
how in this age they are beginning to bloom a little bit out of sync, perhaps. And this is simply called your flowers. Your flowers. I could list your flowers bloomed this spring and into summer. Crocuses, of course, the snow focuses its final crystal meltdown on for winter's slow hush denouement. Last fall, cedar mulch on claims enough to let your snowdrops hang, and coalition irises chase various amaryllises I can't pretend to tell apart. I marvel at the whole up art, explosive, blooming, big shebang your colors to my life can bring. Oh, I might screw up the sequence and overlook the consequence of marches, lovely global warmth, hatching larvae of the moth that rain your rose cambarines in, and rub your heirloom cherry of its gossamer profusion. I can't imagine the confusion you or the forsythia feel breaking out in early April when most perennials reserve. But not because I don't observe how summer's fragrant alliums restore our equilibrium after May's tally of the dead. I'd order order of bloom restored, but don't go much about such things. Let me turn to a, another flower, the rose. Um, there are a number of uh, translations in this book, and this is um, Pierre de Ronsard's famous Oda Cassandre, um, which kind of picks up on that extended metaphor of the rose for beauty and transience. And here Ronsard is urging us to, um, I don't know, pick your cliche, make hay while the sun shines, live in the moment, just do it, all that stuff. How to Cassandra. Hey, sugar, let's check out the rose that wasn't just this morning exposed its crimson garment to the sun to see if she has kept intact the pressed pleats of her crimson dress, so totally like your complexion. Alas, see how now in such brief space, my sugar, so decidedly, alas, she's let her good looks wilt and fall Oh, nasty mother nature that you are, for giving such a lifespan to a flower that she lasts just from sunup to nightfall. So, my sugar, accept as truth, right now while you still have your youth, at the peak of its unplucked bounty. So, Mo, gather all you can reap, as with this flower, old age will creep and lay waste. To your beauty. Well, so that you don't think I'm all flowers and birds, let me read something a little bit more sass, and I'll close with this one. This one is called Babel. Um, unlike those other poems, I suppose, it comes from that confluence of verbal and I suppose some emotional ferment. It sometimes produces a poem. Uh, that cannot too easily be, be reined in or defined, so I guess that's my way of saying it. I'm not quite sure what it's about. Um, Babel. You could say you were having none of it in any of countless godforsaken, good as dead fire tongues in Inuit, en Provençal, Asgelica, not to mention sign, smoke cut above the wrist, a smote of love's telepathos, or tis a scratch and sniff of kiss-ass English. But it's not what you do, but the way, sweet fuck, they watch, then do you in. The cottony body bag, the what you'll pick out your kisser mouth with broken fingers. Present your lady, you who makes me think in mass when I couldn't get you out of my head. If God is love, my love, then who better when in Rome? We lie 
stroke lock. We make no din, do me. It's all good. Chill. This bed, our center is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. And now I would like to introduce Mary O'Donoghue. Mary is a twofer. She writes not only poetry but also fiction, and um, she is the writer of award winning fiction. She was born in County Clare in the west of Ireland. She's the author of an earlier uh, very fine volume of poems, Toll, which was published in 2000. She teaches in the English department at Babson College. Tonight she'll be reading mostly uh, from her wonderful new volume, Among These Winters. Please welcome Mary O'Donoghue. pleasure to read with Aiden. I chastised him earlier because we have read together a couple of times recently, but he didn't bring me to Ireland for the launch of his book. Uh, then we're not on really we're not on the road together, Aiden, if he didn't bring me. Um, I'm going to open with a poem uh, that's about being the first child. It's the first poem in my first book. It makes me remember stomping off to school doing everything first. And I suppose it's a poem that is also about becoming a writer. And it's called Widening the Canal. The oldest sister is groundbreaker for all the girls who follow after. Her birth takes that bit longer. She widens the canal, makes it stronger. The youngest sister slips through quickest the canal at its broadest, she is the littlest. Plenty of room to wriggle and slither, jerking her safety rope along the route with her. And although that poem is quite, uh, I suppose, visceral in terms of my mother's experience, canal-wise, of four of us, we're four, four daughters, um, she expressed a lot of pleasure in it at the same time although she said that it did make it sound as though it was a whole lot easier to give birth than, than it actually is. I suppose not knowing about that, it probably does. So a few years later then, three of us, four has not been born yet. And in this poem, we're a kind of disgrace to the nation and a disgrace to fashion. Um, it's based on a photograph of three of us wearing particular garments that were sent to us um, in a parcel from the United States because our only relatives in the United States um, have ever been uh, two Franciscan sisters who were my mother's aunts and ever so often they would send these clothes to us. Most of the time everything was scratchy, nylon, slack type of style. Sometimes there would be some kind of nuggets in there and on this occasion we've got two two of us got little fur capes mm. so this poem i wrote it to embarrass my sisters i suppose publishing it was embarrassing but not writing it really and it's called osh kosh for gosh after that label and it's for only and trina we're all three of us let outs little big shots would you credit the cut of us Someone had better stop all the lights for us. Locks the state of us, kitted out in the gallimaufry of cast offs from America. Bits and bobs from Franciscan grand aunts, scratchy yonkers jumpers, nine on slacks from Tenafly. In the photograph, two of us wear little capes for the opera, rabbit fur saddling our shoulders, trussed to our throats by pom poms. Harnessed tight, one of us inside checkered dungarees. Flush with her belly and snug to the crotch, like a tiny, hucksterish man. The sun-spangled wall behind us in Annie Quinn's yard is a wall that should itself be a frock, 
splashed with hand-sized lichen. Mary Quant would like it. These clothes on us might well bring on the bullies, but this morning we swagger our couture and we're cool as you please and we don't give a damn, for we are the next big thing. The only thing I didn't do was reveal the identity of the person wearing the horrible slaps. Um, so the sisters grow up and this poem is about watching that youngest sister get ready for her debutante's ball. Um, it's a poem entitled Plans for Prague. We were making these plans on and off for quite a long time and actually this June we'll see the fulfillment of the plan. So I'm happy to read the poem in that respect. Plans for Prague. Deb's girl in a blue dress, spangled shoes, Eiffel Tower hair scaffolded with clips and pins, your big night, the boy with an orchid. You teeter well over my head as I hang drops of pearl from your ears, and your nose is as small as when you were two and hid beads up there for safekeeping. We shared a bed for a while, and my arm limbered up to play doll. Armless, legless, a soft freckled skittle swiveled and smacked by your podgy palms. Two alike not to clash, we have clobbered and thrashed, bitten arms, dribbled blood, deadlocked in tugs of hair across our umpiring father. Our links, a love of the Rococo vocab, mild craftiness with money, a yen for life at the fin de siècle, Gabriel's oboe, plans for Prague. And I suppose growing in different directions, um, uh, seems I mean, it's inevitable in sisters' relationships, and it, it, I think it often seems more glaring, more apparent. Uh, this poem is about that same sister and about a tour she took some years ago when I was probably trying to finish this book and feeling extremely envious that she was out there. So it's called Ljubljana. Ljubljana. An oily brook bubbling over the rock sounds of my sister's name, the pout and babble of a baby in the bath, a name more suitable for her than all the nicknames I've labored over. Her postcard shows Postania Cave, queasy green rocks spilling from the roof like gouts of old candle fat. We're here at those caves, minus the strange people which I can't explain. Vlad Dracul's house is studded with windows, Strange choice of a gaff for a vampire. I can't believe we're here. Her handwriting is skinny skyscraper letters, like an American city, so in love with the senders. This handwriting, nothing like my own rotund alphabet, infuriating her every professor with barcoded meaning, smug and defiant as the Rosetta Stone, until de Sassi coaxed out its secrets. Amber and copper and gold and umber, Empress Elizabeth's burnished lava bowl pours light like sun in a chalice. Oh Vienna, she writes. The ultravox riff makes me laugh out loud at my desk. She tells me I would love it there. Lots to tell, lots indeed. We still use the same fizzing rhetoric, championing our enthusiasms over everyone. We're like Ian Forster's sisters. I'm the one stashed away in a rookery while she journeys out, fritters money, beguiles old codgers, sends back stories. It always amazed me um, the welcome that, that uh, US college students seem to give their parents when they make that first visit to them in the first year of their college. Because all we wanted to do was get out, get away, go home when we wanted to go home, but where, you know, they rarely come to visit us. So I suppose I'm kind of fascinated by the concept of parents' weekend. That's um, important. This poem is about being an adult and sharing my space um, with my mother during her visit a couple of years ago. It's called the Devonian period, and the title refers to a speculated phase in geology when the landmass of Europe joined to the landmass of North America. The Devonian period. One, 
The luggage trolley veers left, further left, skids and judders on its rubber wheels, a curveting horse on linoleum, as she steers it past the milk glass doors that meet and seal behind her. She is small and big-eyed as a child, flushed, stalled amid the savvy and rush of arrivals. She navigates the Babel full hall. Babies parceled in anoraks are handed to grandparents. Girlfriends cradle cellophane roses. We meet. I am five feet five and a half. Her nose meets the notch in my collarbone. Two. That week, we breakfast on brown bread sliced tombstone thick. The bread, she's sure, of my wildest, most diasporous desires. We link arms on the train, chat to our hollow-faced reflections in the dark window, wince at the pain of brakes, rounding oxbow turns, crooked elbows along the track. Three. Through a slice of open door, we hear a ribbon of chimpanzee screams. A raccoon seething with rabies. Grey belly heaving like a fat furred heart between branches. The drop of something through the dark, a pouch full, its soft fall and settle in the high grass. Four. My temper, she knows, is less igneous now, slower to heat and erupt cooling off quickly to leave me stone-faced, impassive, surveying the topography she unrolls, carpet-wise, chaotic in my house. Anarchic bedclothes, a festoonery of jewelry that mocks my one neat box, the origami of receipts, crushed in pockets and purses, longer hairs scrawling cursive things in the sink. Our ways are crusted into us, Without even thinking, I dab a crumb from the corner of her mouth, and blinking, hugely blue, marum lashed, she lets me. It's supposed to change the key, change the focus. Um, maybe I think about language as the big love affair of my life. Mon amour fou, perhaps. But not when it came to the situation described in this poem, which was when, in secondary school, we met once a week, Wednesdays in the afternoon, for elocution class. And this poem remembers, uh, I suppose, the horrors of that class. Good speech. What is good speech? Good speech is speaking out clearly and distinctly with proper emphasis and expression. A, E, I, O, U. First verse of Norman the Zebra at the zoo. We are 14 and we hate Wednesdays, for we must lose our muckle-mouthedness and become violet Elizabeth bots, sugaring and plumbing our epiglottis. This, that, these, and those thistles lose the lisps and the gap tooth twistles. Soft and hard palate, search around in some boy's mouth to find them. The marrow from Mars lurches his way through the nightmares of the girl in our class with a stammer. We are dulcet, we are pregnant in our pauses, as silver tongued as Demosthenes or Audrey Hepburn. We secrete honey, we pantomime, we make eye contact, we make ourselves sick. And we kind of did, you know. After that class, it was kind of hard to get back to the normal register. But perhaps, you know, it, uh, I'm sure it did teach us something. Because I'm not shaking standing up here in front of you. I, and I suppose the, the love of language, it's, I mean, it's not just the, the language of poetry, I mean, but it's the poetry that is embedded in other discourses. And I have a particular interest in mathematics, science, medicine, for the kind of terminology that is afforded in there. Um, so I kind of tinker around 
with that, and I probably have done so since all those science classes. This poem, Dower Narcosi, um, takes its name from a rather barbaric um, treatment for schizophrenia. Um, the, the word is German and it means deep sleep. Um, and it involved putting uh, sufferers into a, a kind of a continued sleep and then waking them quite brutally. So I imagined one particular character put in this scenario, somebody who would have been a mathematician. Dower Narcosi. She has been asleep for three days, a liquid length of time closed over her head like a sheet of lake water. They think they have her dreams cached away in their clutter book of explanance and see no flicker hint from behind eyelids fern stitched with blue veins. But she is navigating equations, pointed fur jungles of isosceles triangles, the screams of chalk and nails like seagull voice, dust of chalk, a scarf on her cuffs. She walks past the bossy signposts of sign and tan, and her map begins to make sense when the two-legged travel stool of pie is pulled from under her and she is splashed awake. She leaves infinity, her last mark, a slender eight sleeping with its face to the wall. which is that most barbaric form, the repetition of six words, but it is tremendously liberating. I had to cheat to start my Sestina, because I took my six words from a very old medical manual, um, a remedy for shrunken sinews. So I compressed it and then used it to tell a story, a fiction. The poem is called Swallows. Take young swallows out of the nest, a dozen or sixteen, and rosemary and lavender and rotten strawberry leaves. I fear the quantity of the swallows, the feathers, guts, and all. Bray them in a mortar and fry them all together. Then put it in an earthen pot and stop it closed nine days. When you shall use it, chafe it against the fire. She should call him in, push him toward the fire, big bear of a boy in a yeti coat. He is 16 and standing on the lawn, patchworked with leaves. Sweet crumbs in his pockets from biscuits for all the dogs on the road. Eyes too close together. He likes outside when rain sedates the days. Every June makes her think of other sizzling days. Sandals on tarmac as viscous as rubber from fire. Walking the pram, she and her sister, 16, fawn-legged, caramelized skin. Short shelter from leaves of three larches. No sounds from the pram at all. A baby with hands clasped water tightly together. Her sister goes back to school and they are together. She waits and loses count of the days of waiting for his eyes to spark, catch fire, and swallow her face. 12 months, 16, then 20, and nothing. Waiting, she leaves it so late. A shocked doctor's questions when all she meant was to give him time. But all the doctor sees is angry rash, toes webbed together, muscles slack as a rag dolls. Tests last for days, and she is sent home. She falls asleep by the fire and dreams of feeding him, fleshing him. Sixteen stone of him now kick walks through wet leaves toward the shed with the nest. 
He never leaves little things to themselves and crushed all the baby swallows, trying to cup them together in his red slabs of hands on one of the days last week. She tipped open beak chicks in the fire. Fire cracks from bones, pluck stench. He is only 16. At 30, his face is 16. He leaves for the home in October with all of his clothes in two bags. White band doors smack together. The days stare her down. Words scream at her from the fire. So from the seduction of a form, Sestina, um, to the seduction afforded by one word. And in this case, the word in the poem goes under a kind of a Trojan horse type of exercise because it appears in all sorts of other guises. And the word in the title is eel. Eel, its serpentine sculpture of water, jellied steel of its back rupturing the meniscus, a black silk ribbon reeled by a rhythmic gymnast, gorgeous scoliosis in motion leaving the sequels to its swim written in ripples that keel to each other, double helix carved in water darker than oil. Boats creel, sargasso snakes writhing, a greasy weave coming to life, then the knife, and skin peeled away slowly with the reluctant give of a satin elbow length glove, grown to love the feel of an arm. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you very much to Mary and Aiden for that wonderful uh, set of readings and uh, very engaging poems. I want to mention uh, that we have books uh, for sale by both uh, Mary and Aiden. Uh, Mary's, I think, are being handled by the bookstore. Aiden's uh, are in a bag fresh from Ireland. Um, and uh, but, uh, if anyone's interested in, in having books uh, from them, uh, it should be easily arranged. Um, we have a few minutes, and I know that some of the students who are here tonight, I think, are involved with the MFA program. Some of the students are with my Keeney Graduate Seminar. And Mary and Aiden, I'm sure, would be happy to field um, questions about poetry, poetry writing, about Irish poetry. Um, if anybody would like to uh, engage with them on that, um, I'm sure that they would hold forth. Don't be shy. <laughs> Turn the camera off. <laughs> <laughs> that might make the questions come easier.